All right, so here we go. We're going to draw out the Drake equation designed by a guy called Frank Drake who worked in America during the 1950s and 60s and 70s at a place called the Los Alamos National Laboratories working on top secret projects. He worked with another guy called Enrico Fermi who was big on engineer, who was big on probabilities and estimations on way of designing experiments, designing instrumentation for various things like the space race. So let's start off with the actual Drake equation. So try not to fall asleep in the next couple of seconds. We have a probability that there might be life somewhere else in the universe. This is the whole basis of the search for e extraterrestrial intelligence that was going on in the late 20th century. Start out with that probability. Then we have to add some parameters in. And as we've gone through from your, your lectures on astrophysics right through to the uh, ev biological evolution, we're going to add all these to the Drake equation. First one is how many stars there are in the Milky Way and how many stars are forming in the Milky Way. So that's the rate of star formation or solar system formation as the basis for life. We all know that you need a sun to have life. So that's a rate. And then we have a, a frequency, a frequency of how many of those solar systems have planets times by how many of those planets are exoplanets. And we know that exoplanets are those types of planets that could potentially harbor life. Add another parameter in here, and we come up with the frequency of those exoplanets having life on them, and that life being complex life forms as we know of, of them, uh, as we learnt last week when we talked about SETI and complex, complex life. These are animals and things like that. So you see we're going up from exoplanets, which are typically characterized as those that would have microbial life, typically is assumed as being non-intelligent, but some might argue, and then life that's complex. We have another uh, frequency here, which is how much of this complex life that is have potentially evolved onto a planet, how much of that, a frequency of that life, is intelligent? And as we learned last week, we don't classify much of the complex life on Earth as being intelligent. So again, we're starting out with really big numbers here, billions, right? I'm going to run through this with real numbers in a minute. Really big numbers here that, is, that are quickly reduced by these frequencies or these probabilities of, that, of those stars actually harboring intelligent life at this point of the equation. Then we come up with some interesting other points and, and some of these are measurable as we see here. We know roughly the number of solar systems in the galaxy and we'll draw out those numbers in a second. Right down to here, this is, very, this is a quite a dangerous one that we'll talk about in a minute. What is intelligence and what's the frequency of intelligence coming about? The next one is basically uh, the, the level of technology that's developed um, that it would allow communication. And as we know, that is the development or the, the technology developed that leads to the uh, innovation of a radio telescope. It's the major form of um, communication we have between uh, for long distances and is used to discover planets, for example. All right, we're getting towards the end now. And we come up with a couple of other parameters here and L being uh, uh, the longevity of these systems. So from how, how long is the life of a whole galaxy? And we kind of know that from astrophysics as well. Life of stars themselves, we know that. And what colors, what heat of a star it is. Planets have a life. But also we get down here and we, we come to realize that us as humans also have a finite life and us as civilizations potentially have a finite lifetime. What is the time for developing communication skills, for example, and that, that, that type of uh, instrumentation you might need to make contact with uh, extrasolar systems? And again, the Drake equations come, come in all shapes and forms. This is the traditional one. 
Uh, we've put this one in at the longevity of systems. I'll explain why in a minute, why we've introduced this one m most recently and, and you'll, you'll understand exactly why we've put this longevity parameter in. But finally, uh, some smart person said, what's the chance of it all happening again? Um, and that is a number that we don't, we don't know these numbers. So can all these steps that we've got from solar system formation up to estimating the length of uh, this, these entities, these universal uh, or cosmological entities, what's the, what's the chance of it all just starting again? And is it all starting again right now in a different potential time dimension, which goes beyond this course? Uh, possibly in third year philosophy, you might study something like that. All right, so let's forget about this as uh, a mathematical equation and let's look at it as I, as I consider the Drake equation or the Fermi paradox is what is the probability of intelligent life being somewhere out, else out there in the universe? And let's boil this down to a few what we call the uh, Brett Nolan simple equation for people that are lacking a bit of I here and they do a Drake equation in this form. So we start off with uh, alien, which is this little thing here. We've always got big feet and big hands. All right, so what's the probability of us finding an alien? And as I said before, we know roughly that there are 400 billion solar systems in just this Milky Way that we live in. This galaxy that we live in has 400 billion solar systems. Let's make that a star. I, I get that. 400 billion. I'll write a number as we go so we can... We can actually calculate how we go with numbers and star formation. By the way, there is probably three of these forming every year. So as the theory would go, new star formation, new galaxy, uh, sorry, new solar system formations are more likely to generate life than others. But let's come back and simplify it here. We've got about four billion a growing number of galaxies in, uh, sorry, solar systems in this Milky Way. Then look at the planets and how many planets go with each of these star systems. So we have um, what's going to symbolize a planet. Everyone knows the prettiest planet is called Saturn. So each of these star systems we know from calculations have between one and 10 planets. We, there's very few star systems in the galaxy that have no planets, all right? So when you, when you take that number, even if you take it down to some of its lowest numbers, this number is then going to increase 400 billion because we've got up to 10 planets per star that could be any, that's in the, we're now talking trillions, okay? So let's just go from billion to trillion. Could be a lot more, or it could be as low as, as half, a, half a trillion. All right, after that, we come to this in, important point here about what's an exoplanet. A planet, one of these planets that potentially has life, or it could be a moon, a moon of a planet as well. So what do we draw? We draw here to represent the potential for life as, as we all know, the double helix. So we've come to this point in this point. We, there's, now this is where we start to estimate. We're going to say that only one thousandth of these planets actually are planets that we'd call exoplanets. And I didn't just make up that 1,000 one number either. That's the number from what we know of. I'll actually do it while we're going through. We know that there's 4,000 planets or exoplanets in our Milky Way. This number is also growing because technology is allowing us to detect more of these planets um, every day. 
So actually the technology is growing at exponential rate. These are the numbers down here. These are the numbers we know today. We know that a potentially one thousandth of those planets are planets that could harbour life. And that by that I mean life that is uh, dependent on water, depending on an atmosphere that's thick enough, all those things that we've talked about before about what, what makes habitability. That number then comes down to four. So we know from looking at atmospheres of these exoplanets that about four of them could potentially harbour life in the form of the chemical basis of life, including DNA. Now, this is where we have a, a complete disconnect in the system, all right? This is where, when we're looking at life outside of Earth, or outside of our solar system at least, we cannot do more than estimate. So if we're looking at, in actual today's measurements, we have four exoplanets or four planets that potentially have life on them. That life can only be estimated to be microbial. That goes back to the numbers we talked about before, uh, about two lectures ago when I was talking about how macromolecules are formed, how they can then condense, remember, into uh, pre-cells or prebiotic chemistry, and that prebiotic chemistry forming microbes. This is the number we're currently running at, that there's potentially about four planets that we don't know about, or that we we do know about that could potentially, potentially harbour microbial life. To take this leap from life or exoplanetary estimates of life to more complex life that it's intelligent, we just don't know. So at this point in time, we often say, or I would say, the chances of life being out there as being intelligent in, in our galaxy is zero or very close to it. Let's say approximately zero. Then we have to come and look at these other, po these other points that I was talking about before. Once we can't estimate the level of uh, development of this life to, to a point of intelligence, it goes back to our previous equations where we're looking at from, from this point in time on a planet, we need about three billion years to get to this point. And that's only from our from what we know of on planet Earth. That rate could be 10 times faster or 10 times slower. So this is basically where we're at right now with the Fermi equation, my form of the Fermi equation. So over here, we've got life as we know it, that's reproductive, man and woman. We know that it can develop technology such as radio telescopes, um, we don't really know how this sort of reproductive complex life develops intelligence or if our estimation of intelligence is actually correct. We might talk a bit, a bit about that in a minute. What we do know, what we do know right now, and this is what I was going to say before, is that this parameter L or longevity is under pressure. And we, we know that because of what we do to, the, to this system that we live on. Essentially, if we look at this equation and consider ourselves aliens, we know that we have a star, we live on a planet, we've got DNA and various other macromolecules, we've evolved into species that can reproduce, we assume we're intelligent, and in, intelligent enough to have the power to potentially destroy the planet, and I'm thinking about we go back to the idea of the guys Fermi and Drake that invented these equations. They all also worked on something called the Manhattan Project in the, in the mid 20th century that actually developed a mechanism for L to be feasible and that was called the nuclear bomb. We also know more recently now that industrialization of the planet, uh, another, another part of what L is, is, is our effect on the climate. So. This, all this leading to, we can't, we, we, we have a big tick here. We know, we actually know the directions we're heading in in terms of longevity because of, because of our empirical uh, scientific work we've done. We also, we don't know if anything is salvageable in terms of repeating what's been done over the last three billion years on our planet. It's very hard for us then to make this estimation here of how 
possible or how probable it is somewhere else in the Milky Way. Remember, yeah, that's a good point. Remember that I was talking about the Milky Way. Milky Way is one of trillions of other galaxies in this universe. The problem being there is when we look at this parameter, the, the, the technology we need to communicate, that probably has to change in order to, for us to communicate, speak with, observe the life that's potential in other galaxies. So in summary, the chance of there being alien life out there, that we have some fixed parameters for the Milky Way. That's based on what we know about star formation, numbers of planets per solar system, number of those planets that are potentially exoplanets that could harbour life in the form of microbes. What we don't really know there then is the chance of that life, microbial life, converting to complex intelligent life. And we do know that on Earth, for example, that, that extinctions have made that come backwards again. This is part of the repeat equation. Life has then had to start again. I've obviously been quite pessimistic here, saying that none of these four planet, exoplanets with microbial life that are probabilistic in the Milky Way have led on to intelligent life. There's no reason why some horses have won the Melbourne Cup with these odds, right? So there's no reason why you couldn't have at least one of those. I've been pessimistic. I've used the base numbers to come up with a, a very pessimistic number. I challenge you to go out there and look on the internet and there is a, a web page called information is beautiful, all one word. Type in some of the parameters that you think might be a little more optimistic than mine. So that's all one word, information is beautiful. Go to the page with the Drake equation, type in some of the numbers that you think might be uh, more realistic in your world, when you are the future. This is about how you use science to estimate how we're going. Maybe be a, bit, a little bit more optimistic than I was with the longevity of the, our civilization and see what you come up with and let me know. Bye for now. <laughs>